Okay. So, if the dad donates a Y, the baby is male. If the dad donates an X, the baby is female. So, males get their Y from who? Okay. And their X from mom. So, if you're a boy and you have problems, you can blame it, you know which parent to blame it on. Okay? My mom gave me a bad X. My dad gave me a bad Y. <clears throat> Period. I mean, that's just the way it is, you know? Like, uh, like with Huntington's disease, um, uh, you have, well, first of all, it's not on uh, sex chromosomes, so we can forget about that. Okay. Um, and there's another thing. Uh, can males be carriers of X-linked traits? <clears throat> that means a carrier doesn't express, let's say, a problem, uh, whether it's color, male color, color blindness or something like that. So a carrier doesn't express it, um, so a male can't be a carrier. If he's got a problem on the X chromosome, he's going to express the problem. Only females can be a carrier. Okay. So, why, why uh, do some genetic conditions affect only males more often than females? And of course, that's Haldane's rule. Male has a single X, so he has only one copy of these genes, not two. A female has two copies, so she can carry a recessive allele without showing a trait. So, in terms of the heterogametic sex, it acts just like a dominant allele. Okay? Because it's actually on the sex chromosome. With a female, it doesn't. Anybody in here colorblind? Can't see um, red and and green? Okay. Now, it turns out color blindness is caused by a mutation on the X chromosome. And um, if a color blind, uh, blind individual, man, uh, um, donates an X, he can donate um, a bad X with a mutation. Or the mother, though, is usually the carrier. She has the bad X, but she has a rescue, uh, so her daughters are fine. And um, this kind of Haldane's rule sort of thing, you really start to see it um, in royal families. <clears throat> As uh, you probably know, or maybe you don't, um, Wherever there's been royal families and there's co-sanguinity, which just means um, uh, like royal blood and not breeding with anyone else but someone with royal blood, whether it's with your sister or brother or your stepsister or, I mean, your half-sister or brother or your um, cousins, uh, alleles that are recessive uh, are more likely to be exposed. Because it turns out, every one of you has about, oh, I don't know, probably 40 or 50 mutations that no one else has. They just happen. Most have no or little effect on you whatsoever. However, it could be that, in fact, if you had this mutation 
and there was someone else, because it's been passed around within kind of like a large royal family, the chances of getting two copies of it, it might not have no effect. It might actually have a very strong effect. So whether it's uh, blue-green color blindness or it's um, hemophilia, uh, the clotting factor, um, also um, insanity, uh, the royals produce, it's amazing how, how um, the effects, I actually looked at a paper on the effects of inbreeding in royal families. And um, most of the kids, in fact, a lot of them were um, not very healthy. Uh, a lot of, very few of them, in a lot of cases, ever made it to adulthood. And if they did, they were worthless. So, now it turns out, of course, um, if you keep doing this, eventually, over many generations, you'll weed out all those uh, recessive alleles with the individuals with two copies of it. And so the, um, that mutant allele will start to disappear from, um, from the population. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, if a colorblind man marries a woman who is a carrier in a recessive allele, what is the outcome for their children? So these are six linked traits. Um, why don't we make a Punit square? The colorblind man We'll do in blue. Um, he's got an X with the colorblind allele, and he's just got a Y. Okay, and then the woman is a carrier, so she has one X that's colorblind, and one X that's normal. Okay, so, um, first of all, in the upper left quadrant, we have an X with color blindness uh, for the woman. Okay, and the man also has a color blind X, so we're... Um, Basically colorblind, um, we have C, C, and this is actually a female who's going to be colorblind. Now this rarely happens, um, uh, but it could, like in a royal family or something like that. Now if we go across, we still got a, a colorblind female, and we've got a Y, so we'll have a man who is um, colorblind as well. Okay, now on the bottom here we have a normal X and we have, so we have an X and an XC, so that's a carrier, and we also have a X and a Y. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, we have a female here, child. We have a male child here that is, in fact, colorblind. On the bottom, we have an X and an X with a carrier, and so this is a carrier female. And here we have an X and a Y, normal male. Okay, so their children, we will have uh, one female that is colorblind, um, a female carrier, a male that is colorblind, 
and a male that is normal. Okay, let's do this again. No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. What fraction of their sons? Okay, so here we have <clears throat> X, X, normal female. Have an, <clears throat> oh, this is also an X. No, that's female, that's right, and this is a male. Okay, <clears throat> and then we have this mutant X. Okay, and then we have a male that's a uh, normal male, X, Y, and then we have a mutant male, X, Y. So, it asks, if you have a carrier female marries an unaffected male, so the male doesn't have uh, he, uh, recessive hemophilia, what fraction of their sons will be affected? So let's take a look. Um, as we said, uh, we've got um, the female on the left. She's got an X normal and an X mutant. And we have a male who's X normal, Y normal. If we go normal female, normal female, we've got two X's, a normal female. If we got a normal female and a normal male, XY, um, we also have um, a normal male, right? Okay. Now, we get to the bottom here. Uh, if we have an X, a mutant X on the, from the female and a regular X from the male, like here, we have a carrier female, X carry. Okay, and if we have an X mutant from the female and a normal Y, we then have uh, a hemophilia, a hemophilia son. Okay. Now the question is, what fraction of their sons? Okay, so fraction of their sons, not all their children. Remember, there's two female children, just their sons. What fraction of their sons will be affected by having hemophilia? Well, there's only two boys here, right? One is normal, and then one uh, has hemophilia from his mother who was a carrier. So it's actually 50%. Okay? Simple. That's their sons. It's actually one out of four, 25% for all their children. But they're only asking here their sons. Okay. So, if you are a colorblind male, um, <coughs> which parent gave you your colorblindness? Well, colorblindness is on the X chromosome. Did you? Yeah. So you got your X chromosome from where? Your mom. You can't get it from your dad because you got your Y from your dad and that's why you're male. So, in other words, you can blame it on your mom. Now, of course, if it's a, 
a mutation on the Y chromosome, then we know you got it from your dad. Okay. Um, this is kind of where we left off. We don't have much left. Uh, after this, we'll go over what's going to be on the exam. I'll give you each question that's going to be on the exam and the answer. Okay? I just want you to know that because I care about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, Red ring color blindness is an X linked trait. Um, it's it's in a recessive X linked trait. Well, it's a little um, miss. It with with a sex linked trait and the heterogametic sex, it acts just like a dominant trait because all you need is one copy. Let's say on the X chromosome for a mutation. Um, to, be, to show up in the phenotype. Um, so in this case, uh, in terms of uh, red green color blindness, uh, it's an X-linked trait. It's on the X chromosome. So if you're a colorblind male, which parent gave you your color blindness? Hmm? Mom. Mom. Exactly. So <clears throat> you can blame your mom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, your dad's free and clear. He didn't do it to you. He cares about you, but it's your mom that did it. Okay? Um, so every time you think about an X-linked trait, uh, just remember whether it's an X-linked trait or a Y-linked trait. You can have a mutation on the Y chromosome as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, the only, you get it from your dad because your mom doesn't have a Y chromosome. So we've been dealing a lot with um, qualitative traits. And um, in other words, real simple phenotypes, whether it's, uh, let's say, pigments in a flower, or your eyes, or your skin, or um, so, actually, skin color and eye color, there's more gene, there's more loci than just one. But you get the idea. Um, purple or white flowers, uh, they may be dominant, in which case, let's say, purple flowers are, um, will show up in the homozygote and the heterozygote, or um, if there's only two copies and they're both white, then you'll end up with white flowers. If it's incomplete dominance, um, you'll, what's in between purple and white? Anybody? I don't know what color that is. We'll just say washed up, out purple. So you'll end up having, the heterozygous will be washed out purple. The homozygote for purple is purple, purple. It'll be purple. And then white will be recessive. Well, white will be white, white. You need a homozygous white. Um, the same thing goes for, um, let's say, uh, cystic fibrosis, which is a <coughs> genetic disease found in mainly northern Europeans. Um, it looks like it might be one of those cases like um, sickle cell anemia, but in this case, protective against typhoid fever. Um, it's got, there's this protein um, that results in very thick mucus um, in, in the lungs <clears throat> and also in the intestines. So there's uh, problems with digestion, but the main thing is the lungs. And people that have it usually get infections, and they usually die fairly young. Um, they're working on some therapies now that might work. There's some hope there. Um, and then, obviously, attached earlobes or not, that's, uh, that's not a really terrible disease, is it? Not like cystic fibrosis, so. 
if you have a, an attached air low, don't feel bad. Okay. <clears throat> now there's also, of course, um, like I said, not just recessive, but you can have dominant traits. I think air lobes, air lobes I think are dominant, attached. Um, three air lobes might be, um, what is it? Well, something else is recessive. Anyway, you get the idea. So, um, now the thing is, not all traits are really affected by, let's say, one gene. Uh, we've been dealing qualitatively with these simple gene models. But oftentimes you have traits that um, show what is called continuous variation. And it's because they're po it's something called polygenic. What that means is there are many genes having small effect on a trait. So instead of having just one loci, you have many. But they don't have a real strong effect, let's say like, you know, flower color or something like that. Just a little bit. <clears throat> and so what you get here actually. What you get here is this is a normal curve, um, and <clears throat> you end up with a continuous variation from, let's say, in terms of height, um, we'll say probably, uh, let's see, four feet to seven feet. Uh, continuous variation. So <clears throat> it's not like it um, can be any of those heights in between. <clears throat> Skin color is the same same way. Um, there is a musical ability to a certain extent. Um, it seems to run in families, so there's a hereditary component to it, and obviously some people are better. There's variation within that range as well. Um, cholesterol levels, all that kind of stuff with um, continuous variation. So uh, here is that normal curve again. Let's say height. Say the average height. Um, actually, there's actually a bimodal distribution for height. Um, but I'll get to that in a second. And you can see how it varies pretty smoothly. Now, <clears throat> okay. Now, why might this idea of the average height be five, five foot eight? Anybody? Why not six feet? Do you think there's a different a gender difference in time, in height? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this actually captures gender differences, but it actually uh, is misleading. So, if we actually look at gender differences, okay, so this is female, let's say five foot uh, six, and male is five ten, okay? 
So uh, you should, a lot of times you want to think about it um, more properly, because there certainly is gender differences. Um, humans are uh, sexually dimorphic. Not as much as like gorillas, where the male weighs, let's say, 600 pounds and the female weighs 200. Okay? But still, there's differences. Either way, height varies continuously. Okay. Yeah. You said that gorillas are, they vary more There's more sexually, they're more sexually dimorphic because of natural selection. Yeah. So, what they have is they have what's called a polygynous mating system, where there's one male with a harem of females. Okay? Males are big because they have to fight other males off so they can control their females. Uh, and you see this in a lot. Now, we don't have a, pol a polygynous mating system. Humans actually have a, a whole slew of different kinds of mating systems. But the same thing goes with, like, elk, bull elk, uh, and then the females are smaller. Um, chimpanzees, too, but they don't have, they have what's called a promiscuous mating system. But even, even though, even either way, the males are bigger than the females. Now, there are... Um, there's uh, a, um, one of the lesser apes where the females and males are monomorphic. In other words, there's no height differences. Okay? It depends on um, these, the circumstances in terms of selection in which they're operating. So with gorillas, it ended up being where males could actually control females, so they had a hair mating system. Um, now we have um, mostly a monogamous mating system, but not necessarily. Uh, you go into um, the Middle East, men often have more than one wife. Um, you go to the Sultan of Brunei, he's got a harem, um, lucky him, uh, with, you know, like a hundred females or w women or something like that. Um, so, and then it's, of course, Humans also have a promiscuous mating system as well. And I don't mean promiscuous in terms of good or bad. I'm just saying many, many partners uh, for both sexes. Okay, so traits that are under the influence of many genes are called what? Good. Okay, and so, you already know this, I'm sure, which is more likely to show continuous variation? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, with eye color, uh, there are three genes. And it's a polygenic trait, even though there's not many, many genes. Um, and it's a matter of the distribution of the pigment. Um, so if you, obviously we've got people with brown eyes, uh, varying colors of brown eyes, some green, and then many, many different shades of blue from kind of a washed out blue to a really bright, brilliant blue like uh, Paul Newman. Um, let's see if I can bring this up. Hold on a second. Three genes, but you can still get continuous variation with three genes. Now, we talked about this earlier, about genes don't code for traits. They code for proteins, and also that it's always a matter of gene by environment interaction. Um, so, this person, let's say, 
has a phenotype later in life where um, she's been out in the sun a lot, let's say, or something like that. But um, a better example, actually, is there are plants that at high elevation look a certain way. Um, I'll, I'll show you what they look like. Okay. Um, they're actually a tree, and it's all over like that. With lit with um, it's a pine tree. Okay, it's called Kermholz. It's from being in high, windy conditions, very cold. And then that same tree, of course, can just be a straight up and down tree with branches coming off. It's like any other normal tree. Now, this is because of gene expression. We've learned about the gene expression. So it's how genes are expressed in certain environments. Um, this is actually, of course, this Krumholtz variety uh, is adaptive at high elevations with lots of wind. Otherwise, the tree is going to get blown over. And it's just a matter of how genes are actually expressed. Um, another good example is um, uh, there are these snails, uh, kind of like what you did with Dar Darwinian snails, that are, um, if they grow as they're maturing, if they're in an environment where there are predators around that will eat them, like a green crab, they actually pick up those chemicals from that predator, and it causes those snails to actually develop thicker shells with more whorls than if they're in an environment without any predators at all, okay? And that's all obviously adaptive. So it depends on how genes are actually expressed, and that's always mediated by the environment that they're in. So in a predator environment with those snails, they uh, develop with thicker shells, and they stay that way the rest of their lives because they were exposed to, um, let's say, the, the chemicals released by a predator, and they're more likely to re be not eaten by a predator because it'll be harder to crush their shells. Okay. And so this is uh, this whole nature versus nurture it's been going on since, um, oh, at least the Greeks, probably more. Um, it's also part of that whole mind-matter uh, dichotomy. Um, is mind separate from matter? You know, let's say the, where the soul is compared to matter, the things that your body is made of. Well, we know that behavior is certainly genetic. Uh, and it has a genetic basis. It also has an environmental basis. But it's not like there's um, only genes or only environment. Now, we can actually test and see how much effect genes c compared to the environment might have. Um, there are some genes that, are, um, that have very strong effects that can, in a sense, override, they're going to show up, those traits are going to show up in any environment. Um, and then there are and polygenic traits, too. And then there are going to be other ones that are definitely mediated by environmental factors. So, and of course, we've talked about how certain trait variants um, are more adaptive in certain environments compared to others, like sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait on individuals heterozygous is resistant to malaria. Um, they don't have the oxygen carrying capacity as normal red blood cells, but they have higher fitness in a malarial environment because they don't get infected as easily. <laughs> Salute. So to say that 
normal red blood cells are better? No, it depends on the environment. <clears throat> So heritability is a measure of the relative importance of genes in determining a trait. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is kind of where we get into um, the twi twin studies. And we use twins, identical twins, uh, to look at heritability. Now, identical twins, of course, share the same genes, they might have a few mutations that are slightly different. However, once, and also, um, depending on what kind of identical twins there are, so identical twins can have their own placenta and amnion in a uterus with another identical twin having its own placenta, or they can share a placenta. So they can actually share a maternal environment or somewhat share the maternal environment, okay? Um, <clears throat> then, of course, when they're born, uh, they might obviously be raised in the same household until a certain age, under many of the same influences. Uh, and then, of course, they're going to start being exposed to different things in their lives. And their gene regulatory um, system will actually start to diverge. So they're not exactly identical anymore. Um, let's see. When I went back to school, I was at Santa Monica City College a long time ago, and there was a coffee coffee place. And the coffee place, um, there was this uh, Hungarian girl, and um, I'd go there in the morning and get a nice cup of coffee. And, but she seemed pretty dour. I mean, she never smiled. Um, she just was serious. Uh, didn't seem particularly happy. And then um, I sometimes really, I'd be, you know, I need another cup of coffee later. So I'd go back. I'd get another cup of coffee. And, and now in the a afternoon, she's really, like, friendly and perky and, you know, how are you doing, all this kind of stuff. And I'm going... Well, that's really different change of mood. I guess, you know, she's certainly not a morning person, right? Um, well, it turns out that she had an identical twin, but their personalities were really, really different. So are you, you guys have similar personalities or somewhat yeah. different? Yeah, okay, yeah. So now, I don't know why those two twin girls had such divergent personalities. Obviously, it might have had something to do with uh, how they were treated when they were younger. Who knows? But anyway, it was like, uh, you know, I was really confused at a certain point, and then I, it was resolved. Um, so after that, I only went back in the afternoon. <laughs> okay. So a lot of this stuff um, has come from twin studies, identical twin studies. Um, there's this film here. Uh, we're not going to watch it. Let's see. Okay, I'd have to put it in there. Anyway, uh, you can watch it. It's pretty interesting. There are these twins, Jack and Oscar. Um... They were growing up in Trinidad, and um, let's see, I guess the father, the father was Jewish, and, um, and then the mother was German. And at the outbreak of the war, mom took Oscar to Germany, and dad took um, uh, Jack to the United States. Um, and... Many years later, they were reunited. But the interesting thing was, you know, um, Jack was raised as a Jew, and it turns out Oscar was a part of the Hitler Youth and hated Jews, okay? Well, years later, they, they, 
they met. Um, at first, they certainly didn't get along all that well. Um, because, you know, Jack was taught all his life that, you know, Jews are inferior. Uh, and, but eventually, it turns out they had many, many, many similar traits. Um, one thing they both liked to do, I guess, was sneeze really loudly to make people laugh. This was independent, right? They... One was living in Germany as um, a Nazi and the other as a Jew, and they both had similar traits. They also married women who had the same first name, right? A um, bunch of different things. It was, it was really quite amazing. Um, at the same time, they were certainly um, somewhat different. I'll give you another example. Um, once upon a time, in uh, North Platte, Nebraska, uh, there was this family, and they had they had twin boys. Uh, nice Middle Western twin boys, um, bubbly, and the grandparents were so excited about it that they actually paid for a trip for the whole family to get on a cruise, to go around and around. Right? And, and so um, they bring the boys along, and now height, I just want you to understand, is fairly heritable. It's like 80 or 90 percent. So you're going to be um, within whatever range it is between, you know, what your twin brother is. Um, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So they get on this boat in Miami, um, and now this family's never really traveled before, but of course, you know, I mean, cruises are fairly safe. Um, they also have a big, you know, the amount of food they, they give you on a, on a cruise. <clears throat> it's amazing it doesn't sink the ship, the amount of food that people eat. Unfortunately for this group, uh, this group on this cruise, they ran right into the path of a hurricane, and all that food that they had been eating it was tossed overboard, you know, talking to the fishes, and they were becoming somewhat displeased with, um, with, with uh, on the cruise. Then they went to Jamaica, and they thought, oh, well, at least we're on dry land now. Uh, they also discovered um, Mai Tais and lots of rum drinks, which are pretty fun. And it was better, and then, but unfortunately they went for a walk and they were confronted by um, a Rastafarian panhead with knife and he robbed them of all their stuff, which happens fairly regularly there. So they were really, now they were kind of like, I wish I could be on land, but now I'm da da da. Anyway, eventually this cruise ship went to Africa, off the coast of Africa. Um, and they were attacked by pirates. So one, a one afternoon, all these kids are in this pool. Um, the little kids, other people's kids, everybody is in this pool. Uh, they're having a great time. One of the kids um, is getting sleepy, so mom takes Sean upstairs uh, for a nap, and the other one stays down. And then they're attacked by Somali pirates. Now, these aren't the R matey, you know, um, kind of pirates. These are um, AK-47 pirates, right? They're a little different. Um, and... Um, now, Somali pirates, there's lots of things for them that are worth a lot. One of the things is, is little babies can be sold on the slave market in Central Africa, like Shad and, and Niger, okay? Um, so it turns out the pirates, uh, dad's trying to protect his son, they shoot him dead. They take this son and they sell him into slavery. Okay, and he grows up in an environment that's rather food poor, right? I mean, 
not good at all. Um, while the other kid, mom never even tells the other kid that he's got a twin brother. Um, and they finally make it back to North Platte. And, of course, after that, mom never wants to leave again. I mean, enough of traveling, right? All these terrible things happen. And this kid grows up in a food-rich environment. Well, there is an environmental influence here in terms of height. First of all, in a food-poor environment, growing really big, well, you probably don't have the nutrients to grow all that big. And it's also expensive. So someone who's bigger needs more food. And so you have this kid that was brought up as a slave. And let's say he's 5 foot 10. Um, and he weighs, let's say, uh, 160 pounds. Now his brother ends up at 6 foot 2 and 250 pounds. And he's um, a highly sought after linebacker. At the same time, though, he's always had this uh, fantasy about joining the Marines. And so he uh, joins the Marines. And they send him into Africa, into Chad, um, no, actually Niger, because of this whole idea with yellow cake uranium, which was one of the reasons we went into the Iraqi war for making uh, nuclear bombs. So they send him in. And lo and behold, he comes across this person who kind of looks remarkably like him. It's a little bit shorter, but very similar. And it turns out it's long lost brother. Okay, they're happily reunited, even though they don't know who the hell they are, but they are. Um, so the brother is shorter and not as heavy. Uh, compared to the slave brother, compared to the, the one that was brought up in the United States. That's all because of interaction with the environment. Okay? It's actually called something called phenotypic plasticity. Um, I guess I could write that out. Um, Okay, phenotypic plasticity. And this is where you have the same genes, but identical genes, but you end up with a different phenotype. Now, it turns out that uh, there were some other things about them that were somewhat similar. They both married women uh, with the name of Masha. Who knows why? They just did. Just like Oscar and, and Jack. Um, the the twin who has been liberated came back to live with his brother in the United States, which made him very happy. Um, though he was still rather dour because of his earlier life experiences. However, in the United States, all hell broke loose at a certain point, and there were large-scale famines. Now, both had kids in the meantime. Uh, let's say um, Sean, the one who was uh, abducted by pirates, he had like three kids, and the other one had two kids. Well, there was a famine. Who do you think survived better in the famine? The smaller one or the larger one? The smaller one. Right. Okay, that's an example of where being smaller in that environment is actually more adaptive, right? So his... The older twin, I mean the uh, bigger twin, died, um, and his kids died, and it was it was ver really bad. But the other one, they survived, um, and they still had uh, three kids, and two of them survived to adulthood. Okay, now 
Remember, these twins are identical, same genes. Um, <clears throat> what was the fitness of the twin who was the shorter one? Had two kids, we'll say, and it, he's related to each one by 0.5, so one. He's got a, a fitness, let's say, relative fitness of one. Now, the other one died, and his kids died with him. Uh, what was his relative fitness? Anybody? He had two kids, but they died. They never reached reproductive age. Fitness of what? One, zero, what? Zero. You would think zero, but remember, they share the same genes. Mm -hmm. So even though the twin who ended up not having any children survive to adulthood had the same fitness as his identical brother. Okay, they both had a fitness of one. This, I'm going on and on about this because, you know, it's just kind of an interesting thing to think about. But anyway, um, so they've done a lot of twin studies to actually kind of break apart what, how much influence the environment is. Yes? It was a Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was Mengele. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he escaped um, to um, U Uruguay. That was Argentina. What? I thought it was Argentina. He first went to, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, I thought they, he finally made it, even anyway, yeah. Um, at that time, uh, Argentina was, um, a guy named per Perón was uh, the leader pretty fascist sort of leader, and so a lot of Nazis went there. So yeah, Mengele, um, did, actually Mengele did a lot of twin studies. They weren't very nice though. Um, he put one twin in a nice warm room, and then another one subject to, you know, terrible cold just to see, you know, um, how long human beings could actually handle cold before they died. So he did things like that. So with quantitative traits, um, it's difficult to predict the phenotypes of their children. Some of you um, might look more like one parent or the other, one sibling or another. We know this because we've studied meiosis and independent assortment and how uh, you get, certainly you get um, a copy of all your chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, but there's crossing over. Um, whichever sperm fertilize that egg, which is kind of a random thing, results in all these different kinds of offspring. So, um, genes also... I know you might think uh, behavior is different than um, like morphology or anatomy, something like that, but not really. It's all got a basis in, in material world. Um, and environment, in some cases, can have really large effects, as we've discussed, um, even on traits that are under pretty strong genetic control. Oh, I guess that's it. Okay.